Speaking of is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for supporting Milwaukee PBS. I grew up in Brookfield, a suburb just west of Milwaukee that's affluent by design. The suburbs, they're glad to be here. There is no one factor more representative of the economic well-being of the American citizen than the home in which he lived. The realization of the American dream, the envy of the entire world. Not long after Brookfield was incorporated in 1954, the city passed zoning ordinances requiring larger homes on larger lots. That helped create higher property values, one of the best performing school districts in the state, low crime rates, and a lot of upscale strip malls. Here's a description of Brookfield from Mike Halquist. We'll be hearing from him a lot in this story. Really like when you think of what is the quintessential type suburb, that's what kind of Brookfield is into my mind. We're like the premier community for folks who are looking for that suburban, kind of like suburban lifestyle. And so they join the stream of family life in the suburbs. So Brookfield's population is about 40,000 people, give or take. And the vast majority of those 40,000 people are, like me, white. We're talking like 95% white when I was in high school in the early 2000s. But that's slowly changing. Emphasis on slowly. Here's Halquist again. You can see that there's a shift. We have a very large and growing Southeast Asian population, a lot of Indian American diaspora, Pakistan American diaspora, Chinese American. Um, We're attracting all different types of diversity, which I think makes a community great. But it's different than what it was in the past when it was, you know, 95 plus percent white. So with that, I think you do have pockets of residents who've lived here a long time who never want to see a community change. You're listening to Speaking Of, a podcast by Milwaukee PBS. I'm Scotty Lee Myers, your co-host, and today we're talking about how last summer's protest following the murder of George Floyd inspired a group of diverse high school students to confront the overwhelmingly white Brookfield to be a more inclusive community. And they did that by proposing a resolution to honor Black History Month, a resolution that turned out to be too controversial. I believe it divides rather than unites all citizens. We've gathered for another roundtable as I lead us through today's episode. Mariano, Lexi, how are you? Hey. Doing good. Glad to be here. Okay, so for the first time in the history of this podcast, I'm going to use the beep effect, if you don't mind, because I think it's warranted. Go for it. (laughs) Are you ready? This story is f***ing crazy. (laughs) Straight up. I'm sorry. It it has to be said. And I say that because I know from the outside, this story might appear to be some kind of city hall procedural, but do not let that fool you. This is about racial reckoning. I mean, we're talking about a Black History Month resolution that was too controversial. Like, what does that even mean? What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out. And more importantly, this story hits home because this is a story about the city of Brookfield where I grew up, where my family still lives. And, you know, I would describe my childhood as pretty idyllic. But as I grew up, my relationship with Brookfield became complicated, to say the least. So when I saw the story, I knew I had to tell it because there's just a lot of dots that need to be connecting. But in order to do that, I have to provide some background and context along the way. So we sort of decided to break this story into three parts. But before we move on, Mariano, I know you're new to the area, so obviously you don't know a whole lot about Brookfield. But Lexi, I'm pointing to you here. Kind of what's your take on Brookfield? What do you know about it? From my understanding, when I was in high school, Brookfield was in our conference. So I went to Wauwatosa East. So a lot of my knowledge of the suburban schools was through like the Chapter 220 program, which would help like open enrollment for mainly students of color that lived in the city that wanted to go to suburban schools. So really all I knew about Brookfield growing up was that it was predominantly white. I'm glad you brought up the Chapter 220 program because I went to Brookfield East High School. It's part of the Elmbrook School District. And again, my school growing up, grade school, middle school, high school was overwhelmingly white. And the black and brown students in my classrooms were bussed in primarily, almost exclusively from Milwaukee. And that was my only sort of interaction with diversity. At the center of today's story 
is the guy we heard from earlier, Mike Halquist. So it's Mike Halquist, and uh, I'm the alderman for the 4th District in the city of Brookfield. Okay, Halquist. He's a young guy. He's white. He's in, like, his mid-30s. He's one of 14 council members in Brookfield, newly elected. He's got a day job working in data analytics at GE Healthcare. He grew up in the nearby suburb of Heartland, then went to UWM, then moved to L.A., where he got a graduate degree at USC. Woohoo, fight on. Yeah. Lexi's chiming in there because she also got a graduate degree from USC. So go Trojans, I guess. Anyways, he eventually moves back to Wisconsin with his wife, Amanda, and they love raising their two beautiful children in Brookfield. It's a great community. I love living in Brookfield. Uh, I married my high school sweetheart. So for both of us, we have both sets of parents nearby. and We really kind of had an idyllic childhood. So we want to do the same thing for our kids. Okay. Do you want to know what my favorite thing about Halquist is, though? Ideally, yes. He's kind of a Beto O'Rourke figure. You might say he's the Brookfield Beto. How so? Well, okay, first of all, Beto O'Rourke, for those to fill you in, is the politician from Texas who nearly lost a U.S. Senate race to Ted Cruz, ran for president later. I say that because both of them, Beto and Mike Halquist, they both went from punk to politics. Though he's often seen in a suit jacket these days, Halquist actually once rocked a mohawk, I swear to God and played guitar alongside his brother in a pretty well-known and still active punk band in L.A. called D.C. Fallout. No way. You gotta have a clip of that. You Beto believe I got a clip. Oh my (laughs) god. All right, this track is called 99 Problems and Intolerance is One. It's off the band's 2013 album Objector. You can find it on the band's Bandcamp page. Mike Halquist is playing guitar and his brother Scott is singing. Let's hear it. What is the problem today? Is it the color of my skin or how I choose to pray? What does it mean to you anyway? Is what makes us all different just fuel for the fire of hate? That's it. That's DC Fallout. All right. Good message. Good message. Good message. I don't usually listen to punk, but I understood the message, so... So those like socially conscious lyrics that you just heard are sort of a foreshadowing of what's going to play out in this story. But it's also just indicative of the band's catalog, having skimmed through it. Their lyrics come with meaning and they're often centered around social justice themes. So how are Hallquist politics aligned with Beto O'Rourke? So that's part of the reason why I played the song, because I think the lyrics are revealing. But I'll let Hallquist answer that for himself. I'm definitely a Democrat. But that comes with a huge caveat. So like blanket labels don't do much for me, but I don't hide by the fact that I've primarily voted for Democrats. I've absolutely voted for conservatives in the past. But from my perspective, when it gets to local politics, find me the partisan sidewalk or the Democratic Park or the Republican sewer extension. That's not how it works at a local level. So why is it such a big deal to him to make his Democratic identity known, but also to make his label aversion so obvious Right, right. in that, Brookfield? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say this is significant in several ways. Basically, you need to know that as a Democrat, Halquist is outnumbered by a lot in Brookfield because Brookfield is historically a very conservative community. Brookfield is part of the WOW counties. That's an acronym that stands for Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington counties. And Waukesha is considered the largest of the three. And according to one analysis, I just read this in The New Yorker, it's the best performing Republican suburb in America. I mean, that's how... Waukesha? Yep. In some metrics. So here's a question, though. Yeah. Why is it that this very conservative, like a suburb, voted him in? How did that happen? How did he win his campaign? Do you have any idea? I would say the playbook for Republicans to win statewide and national elections here in Wisconsin is you secure enough votes in the rural and suburban areas and then hope that you can outnumber the Dems who are running up the scores in urban enclaves like Madison and Milwaukee. But here's the thing. The suburbs are turning purple. And when that happens, like we saw in the last two elections in a series of elections, then Republicans really have a problem because there just aren't enough people in those rural communities. So, you know, the question is, like, where are you going to get the votes? Places like Brookfield once generated 30 
40 point landslides, but voted for Donald Trump by just single digits. So that's a huge difference. And I'm going to do a quick plug here for a segment that Lexi and I did together. It's called Porch Politics. This was when the DNC was coming to town and it was the last throes of the election of the campaign cycle. And Lexi and I were like, we want to hear from voters. We just wandered the streets and anyone who was outside on their lawn, we just stopped and asked them a few questions about the election. And I thought it was really revealing to me personally. I don't know about you, Lexi, but I really felt like we saw some of that crack in the armor in terms of these conservative enclaves really kind of, you know, maybe turning more purple. Yeah, I agree. And I think people talking about their voting decisions can be strangely intimate, like explaining things. I think we get in a culture of just what I say is right. Boom, boom, boom. But really hearing Trump and Biden supporters alike explaining why they're backing a particular candidate and how that kind of lines up with their life experiences. That was really interesting to me. Did you get any surprises when you were out there? And... Absolutely. Um, like Scotty said, it was I was surprised at how many you know areas were becoming more purple. We found out that people aren't a monolith, right? Yeah. Like we talked to a black Trump supporter yes. in Grafton who had previously voted for Obama, but was very strongly supporting Donald Trump in this election. People like I've mentioned, hey, I'm voting for Trump. They're like, how can you do that? How sick are you? You know, they go ballistic. Oh, my God, it's horrible. You're a black man voting for Trump. Oh, he's so racist. And I'm just looking at these people going, no, he's not. And here's another point. So, like, how does this connect to Black Lives Matter and sort of the resolution we're talking about today? There was a Marquette Law School poll done late last year in 2020. And what we discovered in that poll was that the favorable rating for Black Lives Matter in Milwaukee suburbs experienced a 13 point drop in support from June to September of 2020. So right after the murder of George Floyd, there was significant support for Black Lives Matter in our suburbs. But as time moved on, as sort of the the messaging in the media changed, as politicians exploited the moment, as people began to see things on their television sets, we saw that support for Black Lives Matter drop. So with all this happening, let's take it back to Brookfield. How was the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter movement last year, how was that impacting Brookfield? Yeah, so Halquist, he gets this idea. It's the beginning of the year. February is right around the corner, and he wants the city of Brookfield to officially recognize Black History Month. There's been a lot of engagement from the community on this issue. There were Black Lives Matter protests, which I never would have thought that I would have seen in Waukesha County, let alone in Brookfield, that were organized by students. So that was his kind of way of what change can I make in my position. Right. Okay. So this was not something that Brookfield had already ordained. It's Black History Month. No, not officially, not in the I hereby declare February to be Black History Month kind of way. And Halquist says the reason why he wants to do this is because he was totally inspired by what he saw happening last summer in the streets across the country, including in Brookfield. What do we want? Yes. People lined the streets outside of the Brookfield Library to show their support for the Black Lives Matter movement. I never thought I would see a civil activism in Brookfield. I've lived here since the 60s. I found this to be an extremely conservative community. So how big was this crowd? I mean, there were hundreds of people there. You know, you can go online and see the clip. It's from Spectrum News 1's Megan Marshall, who was live at the scene that June day in 2020. And those protests were organized by high schoolers. I mean, we're talking teenagers here led this movement. So Halquist reaches out to a group of these students and invites them to help him draft the Black History Month resolution. I think the younger generation gets it, and I think they need to be included in this process. I reached out. I wasn't really sure what kind of response I would get back. I was elated to get five students who are really excited to do this. Okay, those five diverse students... I'm Jaina Gria. I'm a junior at Brookfield Central High School. I'm Rihanna Hassan. I'm a senior at Brookfield Central. I'm Langston Board. I'm in grade 12, senior, and I go to Brookfield East High School. My name is Cynthia Liu. I go to Brookfield Central High School, and I'm a junior right now. And the fifth student was Jose Zapian Guerra, a junior at Brookfield East, who didn't want to be interviewed for this story. 
So together, the five students, all of whom are minorities in their classrooms, Halquist and this guy named Shane Arnold, he's a colleague of Halquist at GE Healthcare and a member of Mentor Greater Milwaukee, they got to work. Halquist and Arnold offered some basic civics lessons along the way and provided some general guidance. But it was the five students who thoughtfully composed that resolution. Here's Rihanna. All of our meetings were done virtually just over for a few times throughout like a two-week period. And Jaina. Alderman Hallquist emailed us some old like resolutions from around the country. And we all took a look at those and kind of just formed our ideas about what we wanted to be in our resolution. And all of the students said they wanted the resolution to call out things like slavery, racial profiling, the school to prison pipeline, the inequalities in the legal system, in policing, in housing. They wanted to bring attention to the many gradations of racism that have plagued us and continue to plague us. Well, first of all, in high school, I'm pretty sure I didn't know what a resolution was, let alone helping write one. So can you just talk a little bit about what the resolution actually says? Yeah, good point. I mean, I don't know if we want to get into the whole thing because we might be here a while. Maybe what we can do is release the entire resolution later as a podcast bonus episode or something. But basically, it's like eight paragraphs long, sort of written in that classic city hall language. And it starts off like this. Whereas during Black History Month, we celebrate and recognize the many achievements and contributions made by Black Americans to our economic, academic, artistic, scientific, athletic, cultural, spiritual, and political development from the Brookfield community and beyond. So that's pretty straightforward so far, right? And then about the third paragraph in, the resolution gets a little more... Well, let's just hear it from the young authors themselves. Whereas, despite all the progress, the legacy of slavery and segregation still persists in our nation in the forms of mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, racial profiling, educational inequalities, housing and employment discrimination, racism and bias. We acknowledge the damage caused by the historical use of redlining, restricted access to FHA loans, cultural barriers, and other financial or governmental regulations by suburban municipalities, which resulted in the underrepresentation of Black families in these communities. The observance of Black History Month is a much needed step to continue to battle racism, while building a city that is more inclusive and equitable for all residents, while recognizing the overwhelming contributions of Black Americans to our community. Whereas the city of Brookfield is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and mutual respect as fundamental aspects of a healthy, thriving community, and the presence and viability of diverse families continues to enhance the quality of life for all residents in the city of Brookfield. Now, now, therefore, be it resolved, the, the Common Council, Council of Brooklyn recognizes, recognizes February 2021, 2021 to, be to be Black History Month. Black History Month. What do you all think about that resolution? Yeah, they are very intentional and specific, and it wasn't just a celebration of Black history. They brought in the the history of systemic racism, which is really interesting because you typically do not hear of that in a lot of schools when they celebrate Black History Month. They don't bring up the first sin of our country in relation to slavery. So they, that is really interesting, especially for a suburb. I'm interested to see how this goes. That, that's a great point because a lot of these same students are also at the forefront of an issue I hope to talk about in an episode down the road, which is they're really challenging the school district to have a better curriculum about our history, about our original sin, about it more, about including more narratives in American history, about looking at these things in maybe a more honest, less glossy way. So it's it's interesting that you picked up on that point. You know, as a former black high school student that went to a predominantly white high school, We didn't have anything like that when I was in school. We didn't have anything Black history related. We didn't talk about Black people in my classes. Luckily, I went to Milwaukee Public School for pretty much all of my life besides high school. So, you know, I had a very radical fourth grade teacher that had me write a paper on the Nat Turner Rebellion. (laughs) So (laughs) in high school, I was like, well, I kind of know a lot already. But for a lot of students that aren't getting that kind of education, that can be very lacking. Were you aware that you were missing that curriculum in high school when you were a teenager? Did you recognize that? Or only in hindsight, do you recognize that? In hindsight, I think in the moment, I was really focused on how do I blend in? How do how do I find success in my classes? How do I get along with my peers? Because again, it is a culture shift of 
being around a bunch of people that look like you and there is diversity because there were white students in MPS as well. I think I was more so focused on blending in and maintaining. So this is interesting for, you know, these students to say, hey, we are here and we want these things to be addressed in our education. I think the value of having a full view of history, especially in a country that has systemically excluded chapters of its history that don't promote a particular narrative of a benevolent America that has always done good or this idea of linear progress, like we're always getting better, which is not the case. I think we need to know that, and especially in education, kids need to know this. And something I wanted to point out was that they started this resolution in 2020, right? 2021. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, they started it, and it it seems like they started it just before this whole conversation about critical race theory in schools really, like, the debate really got heated. So this is a very timely story, and I'm interested what Hallquist thought of this resolution. Well, and interestingly enough, the students said they actually watered down some of the language or omitted topics altogether, knowing that what they wrote might be controversial. So from the beginning, they recognized that this was delicate, but they didn't want to sugarcoat anything either. I thought that this might make some people uncomfortable, but I also think that being uncomfortable in these things is natural. You should be uncomfortable knowing that in the past, people were enslaved. Like, that's something that should make you uncomfortable. And Lexi, to your question before about how did Halquist feel about this? Well, he supported it 100%, but he wasn't sure how it was going to be received by his colleagues or the general public. I told my wife, I really hope this goes smoothly. I hope people see this for what this is, a great step forward, a way to kind of broadcast Brookfield as a forward-thinking community that is welcoming and is, you know, accountable and understands that in the past, not all people had the same rights in this community and that that was a bad thing. I was hoping we could make that kind of statement, but I knew something would happen. Uh Uh-oh. I'm guessing something happened. Oh, something happened. All right. And what happened led Hallquist to eventually say this. And instead, we get a proclamation by one person, which, again, whitewashes and revises history to say, let's put a quote unquote positive spin. I'm not here for that. It's not my job to put a positive spin on racism. It's my job to tell the truth. I take that very seriously. So what exactly happened? Positive spin on racism. What's Halquist talking about here? We'll tell you next time on Speaking Of. I'm Scotty Lee Myers. I'm Mariano Avila. I'm Alexandria Mack. We'll see you next time. And thank you all for listening.